We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program the Arva E. Strickland Distinguished Professor of History and Black Studies at the University of Missouri and the author of Land of the Fee, Hidden Costs and the Decline of the American Middle Class, Devin Fergus. Welcome to the program, Devin. Pleasure to be with you, Sam. I wish it could be on a on a bit brighter topic and subject, but uh, it's a pleasure being with you, nonetheless. Well, let's. I mean, why? What? What was it that led you to uh, to look at? Well, maybe we should define fees first, just so that we we get a sense of what we're we're talking about. Sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, I use this expense definition of fees. So, so by fees, I'm talking about any cost or expense uh, which is in addition to to principal. Uh, the private sector, for instance, plays kind of a shell game um, in order to sort of circumvent regulators often. And so, uh, for instance, uh, when let's say when petty loans sort of first sort of hit the market in, in the early 1990s, uh, one of the ways in which they tried to circumvent, um, especially sort of state and some level federal regulators, by saying, no, no, we don't charge interest rates, so this isn't usury. Uh, these are actual fees. These are sort of administrative costs, administrative fees, and so, and so uh, again, the use, my 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 use and application of fee is is sort of an I mean an expanded one. It's anything that's in addition to to actual to addition to principal. Um, so, for instance, an origination fee, uh, as I gave the example with uh, the petty lending industry, it could uh, many times really be a fee as a de facto uh, APR or interest rate. Um, default fees, uh, prepayment penalty fees, as you would find, in, for instance, in subprime mortgages. Um, and so these fees come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and colors, but in, it's in effect anything that's in the, you know, beyond beyond the principal loan amount. Uh, and, and we see fees in the, in the, in the public sector, right? Um, fee as a sort of proxy uh, for taxes. Uh, and so and we can have that kind of brief conversation if you want to as well. Well, I mean, so. I I remember uh, that uh, back in the day when Mitt Romney was governor of Massachusetts and he promised no new taxes and then he just basically instituted a ton of new fees. I mean, the big problem, it seems to me, with fees as opposed to taxes is that fees are um, far more regressive uh, in terms of a form of, of, of revenue for, for the government and also – uh, far less, uh, I guess, transparent. That you hit the nail on the head. I was gonna, I was gonna weigh with the transparency argument, but you, you already did it precisely. Far less transparent. Oh, and often we find with these um, um, that they're often difficult and almost impossible to opt out of. And so the implication of a fee is that a, a fee is sort of um, item driven. Uh, but we know, let's say, with higher education, uh, so the state of California may not raise this tuition. But they sure as heck raise their fees. I'm a university professor. Uh, students at the University of Missouri have to pay tuition, but there are these also there are these the, there are these in cost fees, and if they don't pay the fee, um, the user fee, they cannot sit in my classroom. And so the implication is that fees are are sort of an itemized sort of thing, an a la carte sort of thing. But in reality, these fees are often some critical integral to, to the cost of a product and it's impossible to opt out of um, in, in the same way that, that often taxes are. Uh, oh. So absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So you've, um, I, I mean, I feel like you um, have already half answered this, but um, just give us a sense of the, 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 the size of and the importance of these fees in a broader story for um, particularly the middle class. Sure. Um, and so what we find is that, uh, again, the, the cost of these fees uh, uh, are cost over um, a trillion dollars per, um, per, per U.S. house. I mean, not for U.S. house, but per, per, for, the, for the U.S. Um, and so, and broke it down to, uh, let's say, uh, an individual, an individual median income eats up at least uh, almost half of their, uh, their income. And so, we're talking, and I'm talking about particularly fees, and and this is part two to, to point out, Sam. Uh, my work really looks at often fees in critical areas of upper mobility. So I'm not necessarily talking about, let's say, a, a cable user fee or something like that. And that's then that's important and significant, or, or or a cell phone phone fee. Again, I wrote a piece a few years ago for New York Times about the rise of um, phone fees. 
but I'm primarily talking about fees that are essential areas of upper mobility. Um, the fees associated uh, in the things like housing or higher education, uh, fees that are, are, are linked to a link to employment. Um, and we could sort of talk about the ways in which the private sector, the most ubiquitous and common response to issues of wage stagnation. And then what takes us from home to school and work, uh, fees that are, are, are associated or attached to transportation. Uh, particularly employers want people with, quote, reliable transportation, i.e. a car. And that's what employers mean, reliable transportation. And then there are fees that are associated with, um, again, the automobile, particularly, or insurance fees. And so what we find is that not since they have fees sort of escalated in, in all areas, but particularly these four spheres in which this have been critical for mobility, housing, uh, education, and employment, and what takes us from home to school and work, the automobile. And, and these fees have created obstacles for, for barriers for entry into the middle class. And they've also worked to actually erode the middle class in, in various ways. Let's talk about... Um... This is uh, timely. I think uh, my, my audience is aware that I had a, a, de a debate um, with uh, a guy who, you, I don't know, you may be familiar with. He spends a lot of time on college campuses uh, from uh, Turning Points USA about um, sort of the uh, about the middle class and, and some of these things. Particularly, we 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 got into the 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 housing crisis and the uh, financial the subsequent financial crisis in 2008 and. Um, and uh, le let's talk about housing first in terms of these fees and what the implications are and um, and and how in many respects. I mean, I am um, familiar with some aspects of how the fees uh, drove this crisis and that we've talked about on this program, both, I think, in the um, origination of mortgages, but also even in the wake of the crisis. Uh, the allure of fees for um, a lot of these banks was greater than their desire to um, uh, to, refi to, to refinance or to uh, to I, I should say amend existing um, uh, uh, mortgages under HAMP. But um, tell us where where fees play um, the most impact in the the um, the, the story of subprime. Sure, absolutely. And so what we find with, for instance, the, the rise of the subprime mortgage market is that um, all of these, um, the subprime mortgage uh, loans or products which had these creative or toxic, inst toxic instruments, uh, prepayment penalties, which is uh, one of my favorite sort of um, uh, financial instrument, toxic mortgage toxic, it, it, it's sort of counterintuitive. It penalizes someone for paying their bills earlier on time. And, and, and so, I mean, that would be sort of one example. Um, the balloon payment fees, uh, as well as um, just for mortgage sort of charges or fees, all of these um, aspects and products with, that are associated or attached to a subprime mortgage, all of them um, uh, increase the likelihood uh, that a borrower would go into default. And, and, and so... Uh, okay, each of those each of those aspects that were associated or attached to, to the subprime mortgage, and you're precisely right. Um, uh, initially, subprime mortgages get marketed to um, people who have uh, less than stellar credit scores, uh, i.e., something less than sort of 660. But it becomes so profitable uh, that by the time we get to the financial crisis, uh, the average um, prime borrower was being sort of shunted into or channeled into. Uh, the the uh, subprime mortgage market just because of the profitability of these subprime mortgages, uh, and so again they become extremely sort of profitable. And and here I'm going to sort of say this to to you, Sam. I'm actually uh, I'm also a, a visiting professor in in Northern England at the University of Northern North Northumbria University in Newcastle, um, and then in the UK, it's conservatives who are pushing for um, creative and inventive ways to Help in help consumers have stronger credit scores. Specifically, there's conservatives who are arguing uh, that let's say your your rent be included um, as far as your credit score. Right? Um, it would be wonderful thing in the U.S. if you would find conservatives um, uh, who would make an argument uh, that let's not um, try to sh um, channel people into these subprime mortgage markets like we're, like we're having people now do today by saying the underwriting standards in part 
or, or at least under the Obama administration, were too tight. We need to loosen those standards. Uh, it would be great if we could have conservatives in the U.S. who would actually make the argument. Um, let's uh, redefine what's, what's, what's a quality credit history and not simply look at the history of mortgage borrowing, mortgage lending, but look at people who pay their, pay their utility bills on time, pay their rent on time. Um, those kind of ways could, have, if, if you use that, it would actually help borrowers increase their credit score, uh, which would mean that fewer borrowers would actually be shunted into these subprime, or, or now it's, it's called non-prime markets. It's a, uh, a thorn by a different name is still a thorn. Right. Um, now it's called non-prime mor um, mortgage products. And so it would be wonderful if conservatives in the U.S. Uh, would take a page out of conservatives, at least in the U.K., and, 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 and people should understand that, that the subprime is just simply a way of, of justifying far more fees, right? So there is so, a, and so uh, because the idea is that what we're, we're you know, uh, not only do we jack up an interest rate because we're theoretically taking more risk, but also um, we, I mean, what is the justification for the, um, uh, the, the 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 fees in this instance we're taking more risk but we want to take more risk so that if you pay this thing off there's a uh, prepayment penalty or um or is it also that there's an awareness of like there's just probably a correlation between people who have poor credit scores and people who are not financially savvy um i mean that correlation is is absolutely is there as well um that so yeah people who have um lower credit scores aren't Financially educated, um, and, um, and and yeah, and so we can. I mean, I mean, there's so much to discuss here, Sam, because um, not we we can argue that, that it's not necessarily financial education um, is the key. And in fact, we we've gone through a period of now the last 30 years in which um, financial contracts and documents have gotten exponentially longer, right? And at the same time that the individual and the time they have to process all this information, that time has gotten uh, increasingly um, lessened. And what I mean by that is uh, individuals now today commute much farther than their grandparents or parents did 30 or 40 years ago to go to work. You're also working longer hours than people did to a generation or two ago. So you're working longer hours, you're commuting farther. You're also in this sort of what I, what I like to call this sort of extracurricular arms sort of race. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a parent of a child. My child just came from French class. He has he has um, he has a, a martial arts class. He's in all these extracurricular activities. Why? Because he's competing against other kids of his same sort of class in college. Right? And so we experience now is that individuals have less time than ever before to read and process these complex financial documents, which have actually gotten much longer over the last generation. And so how do you square this circle? And the way you square the circle is by bringing in um, financial regulators to, and, and de having them delegate responsibility. And now the private sector understands that there's a process of information asymmetry, um, that you have less time to process this information, and that financial literacy is is really a, a, a canard or a red herring um, because of, for, for, for sundry reasons, some I sort of laid out others we can sort of get into. Um, and so they, they take advantage of, 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 of borrowers across, I'd say, the income spectrum, but is most devastating on historically vulnerable populations. And, and, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau went a long way in uh, requiring more plain English and shorter forms, particularly, I don't know, uh, as much for mortgages, although there were certainly reforms in that process. But across the board on some of these contracts, particularly, I think it was, you know, like uh, credit card uh, contracts and, and, and whatnot. Um, a a absolutely right. And, and we, we see what what's happened there with the um, with the, the current acting you know, director Mulvaney, at least um, going through a process of actually of, ca of catch and kill negative reports by his staff who come out with negative reports about the industry. And so you and this is one of the great ironies, right? For a long time, conservatives have made the argument: uh, we don't need regulation; we just need greater, fuller disclosure of financial information, and let the consumer decide. And what we experienced now in the last few months is actually this, these sort of same pocket or, or slice of conservatives providing less information um, through this via, via these catch and kill 
um, of reports that um, CFPB has been trying to put out, but again, Mulvaney and others, as well as Betsy DeVos, who's an education department, have been catching and killing and suppressing. Um, and so, yeah. Um, and, and let's, I mean, let's talk about uh, student debt. You bring up uh, Betsy DeVos. One of the things I know the Trump administration has done in terms of deregulation was we have this um, massive problem in this country that it was actually quietly, I think, one of the things that the Obama administration was doing quite well was beginning to crack down on what is not 100 percent a scam. Uh <laughs> Uh, nothing ever is. But the for-profit university industry is largely a um, an extraction machine trying to extract uh, public money via student loans to um, to students. And they tend to be uh, some a little bit older students who are going to these universities uh, ostensibly to to increase their earning potential in uh, the business world. There's very little data to support this. And there was a regulation that if you were an institution that was putting out, uh, was was handing out diplomas to people <clears throat> and they would go back into the workforce and there was no return on investment, you had certain limitations as to how much revenue you could derive from student loans. And Betsy DeVos basically said, oh, we're, we're, we're lifting that. <laughs> You can you can keep pumping out people with a uh, essentially with a product that is defective and we'll still keep um, uh, giving you money. Uh, talk to us about uh, how the the student bub debt bubble uh, grew and what the implications are in, in particularly in the context of fees. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And the origins of the, the growth of the student debt bubble really dates back to to um, the Reagan administration. And, and, and here I'm going to sort of take a, 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 a just a bigger, broader step back and have a look at a sort of almost a sort of meta view. Um, and, and it was just a fundamental philosophical shift that occurs um, by Reagan and the Reagan. Um, and so the, 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 the architecture of the financial aid program really sort of gets in place in the early in the 1950s under Dwight Eisenhower. Now, um, a Republican. Now, Eisenhower wasn't some flaming liberal, but um, it, it actually in many ways was sort of reticent about even the financial aid program. But he, he sees the value of of, um, of financial aid uh, for college students, particularly um, as, a, as a means to address national security issues. And so, so Eisenhower and others sort of erect the financial aid system. And, and so since the 1950s, the financial aid program system has been a had been a bipartisan sort of project of both liberals and conservatives. And those who are students of U.S. history know about the, the consensus era of American history. And this is sort of a reflection of that. So, um, but in the 1980s, what you find uh, is a fundamental and a dramatic shift of by conservatives who begin to see the expansion of financial aid in, in its existence um, to, to students and begin to see students not as future tax contributors as Eisenhower and others saw it, Eisenhower and obviously Lyndon Johnson, but in the 1980s begin to see tax, um, excuse me, begin to see students as tax eaters, not as so not as future tax contributors, but as present day tax eaters, and imagine and looked at and and, and use the rhetoric of using students as similar to those who are on welfare, so the the um, the, the, the 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 welfare queen or the unemployed father who's 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 bilking money out of the system or grandma on on Medicaid. It, it, and then it basically sort of lump the college student in with, um, quote unquote, these undes the undeserving poor. And with that sort of mindset, what they did was they rolled back low interest student loans. They rolled back um, grant programs and invited the private sector more so into the funding and finance of higher education. You know, and that invitation to the private sector um, gets enlarged in the 1990s under, under Clinton, but primarily it's, it's actually radical Republicans who do it. And you remember the con Congressional Republican Revolution of 1994. Um, and they basically pushed back against something called direct lending in the 1990s. Um, and they really muzzle Clinton and, and those who are pushing for direct lending, and they expand the private sector market. Uh, and push back against sort of government regulators and education. And what we find uh, with this rollback of direct lending in the 1990s um, 
Can, is that um ala it, elaborate if you could on on direct lending just explain to us what that that program is sure and i'm going to sort of say that direct lending is almost as it sounds um and so rather than a system in which um well, so directly is basically when the where the, where the government um, um, has lends money primarily from the treasury directly to um, college students, or gives it to the financial office in the college, and then they, then they disperse it to college students. Um, and that system really cuts out the middleman. It cuts out, for instance, the subsidy um, banks which might be subsidizing the loan. It often cuts out uh, the loan servicer. And so it was more of a of a direct lending. Um, from from government to the student, uh, and and again that system which cuts out all these middlemen, whether it's the, the banks on the banks on the front end, or or really student loan services, reduce the cost of the student loan. I mean, if you can imagine, just the administrative costs are cheaper, right? And not only the administrative costs are cheaper, but also the actual loan product itself is cheaper. Now let's imagine imagine this, Sam. Um, because the loan itself is cheaper, it means that the student who has to pay back that loan has to pay back less. And what we know um, in whether it's, whether it's mortgage market or whether it's payday lending or whether it's or, or higher education, if a particular financial product is cheaper, as logic dictates, it means that the borrower is far more likely to pay it back. And so that means that the borrower is far less likely to go in default, which means that the taxpayer who's actually funding both the direct lending as well as subsidized lending programs is far more likely to get their money back. So a government gets the money back, students get their money, um, and they get it faster. And so it was a system which actually worked uh, for every population except for the financial services industry. And, and, and so because it didn't work for them, they pushed back and, and they pressure um, lawmakers to bring them back into the to the system, and this is what happens in the 1990s, and they push out direct lending, uh, and they bring back um, these the private sector, uh, and then you see a whole slew of abusive practices and quid pro quos. And once government gets pushed down in terms of direct lending program, private sector comes in, and then they begin to to give sweetheart deals to. Financial aid officers, um, kickbacks of various sorts. Uh, we just had a World Series game last night. Unfortunately, my beloved Dodgers lost. Uh, but let's say um, in the 1990s, you wanted to go see your, your Yankees uh, play in the World Series. Um, uh, the bank might have a couple of tickets for the financial officer, and they'll give that financial officer some t tickets if they would give them a access to student lenders. Now, once this, the bank got access to the student lender, I'm sorry, to, to the student borrower, I should say, um, they didn't care, the, the university or the education office, uh, financial office didn't necessarily care the kind of terms that were given. Right. Uh, they were just ca caring about the kickbacks that they would get. Um, well, and this is a system that existed from the 1990s through the 2000s. And we see several states attor state attorneys general with lawsuits against various student lenders through this system. That was the abusive system. And the great shame is that DeVos and the Trump administration want to go back uh, to the to this sort of wild, wild west sort of attitude of the 1990s and 2000s, where there's all this abuse taking place. We see the origins and rise and spread of student loan abuses and, and student loan debt. So, all right, so um, just to, to uh to to make it clear and also to take the opportunity to uh, state that I'm a Red Sox fan. Um <laughs> and so I'm very happy about last night. But uh yeah, you'll be happy about tonight too, I'm uh, sure. <laughs> I'm hoping so. But um the but but so we had uh this type of abuse where there was a sort of like extraneous middlemen that were placed into the process of delivering government backed and government really uh um uh, funded loans. Uh we 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 threw that off. We still obviously have a huge um, uh, debt problem, but now we're starting to see first uh, the, the 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 sort of the first order problem we have is fees that are generated um, and extraneous from private debt collection agencies that are now making their return back. You know, uh, following the Obama administration, where there was a significant um, push that to the extent that it could be done just through executive order to push a lot of these people out from uh, uh, from the, the, the loan process. We still have a massive problem with loans, obviously, and a, and a problem with uh, the rising cost of, of education. But this is sort of like an added-on 
uh, attribute. And and so where what is that? Do I have that uh, history right that they were pushed out of the industry to a certain extent and they're being brought back in? No, no, absolutely right. Push, I mean, push out industry to to a large extent through direct lending, um, and now they're being brought back in. Um, by the DeVos administration. And, 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 and again, this is, I'll stress this too, it's by ideologues uh, because um, if you want to do a simple cost-benefit analysis, um, these loans are still cheaper and more efficient if done by government. Um, and so if, if they're really concerned about what's, um, what's the, the more efficient sort of product, it would be to, to kick out the, keep the middlemen out um, and to have a direct lender program. So, and, and this is actually, again, um, but both bi bipartisan administrations have done studies and research on this. Um, and so, for instance, Lawrence Lindsay, um, the Republican under 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 George H.W. Bush, I mean, talked about how efficient um, a direct lender program was vis-a-vis -vis, um, guaranteed student loans. And, 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 and so, uh, but but again, this is driven um, by, by people with a, a sort of particular agenda, and also um, by this sort of cozy relationship with the, with the donor class, the financial donor class, and, and, and those two things have, have created and, and um, created this problem. I, I will say this is one sort of um, coda too um, that it, I see. I view as not simply an, an add-on to the story of the rise in cost of college. It's part of the bigger and broader story because what happens too is that um, the federal government uh, begins to roll back its contributions to higher education. Right. Um, and, and so that means there's a, there's, a, there's a shift in that cost from the public sector, um, to, I mean, from, from public sector to, to, to individuals, from institutions to individuals. And this is what explains the part of the rise of cost of college. Um, and so it's part of this, this, this bigger and part of this bigger story about public, uh, the public sector and government's um, rollback of its contribution and support for higher education. All right, and um, and and lastly, I mean, the, you you also um, have a chapter on on uh, wage stagnation and the implications. Uh, I, I mean, again, it's it's almost there's always like sort of a uh, a push and a pull, right? Like the this dynamic where the federal government rolls back funding for. Um, for publicly uh, subsidized colleges, uh, states cut back on this. Therefore, loans come in to fill the um, fill that uh, that delta because students now are required; uh, they have more uh, responsibility to pay those fees, and then that gives the opportunity. I mean, they, uh, for for um, for uh, you know uh, the fees to actually go to uh, college tuition, and then. Um, then the private industry comes in as like barnacles on this uh, transaction as a way of like stripping more cash out of that system. And on some level, that's what we see too with the, with uh, the idea of like payday lending is that uh, on one hand, you, you, you uh, pressure, there, there are forces that, that create wage stagnation. And then the other hand, you, um, you come in with a sort of a, I guess, a neoliberal a solution, as some would characterize it, which is like, oh, we're, gonna, we're going to loan you money so that you don't actually need to get paid. Uh, and, but uh, we're also going to make a lot of money off that transaction. It's going to throw you deeper into deeper into debt. And so you'll, you'll be a repeat customer until uh, one day when you can't. Oh, no, you you've summarized it very well. Um, so there's very, very little I can really add to, add add to that. Um, um, you're absolutely right. Um, that um, that um, uh, the, the rise of payday lending is really the private sector's most common uh, ubiquitous response to to the, the generational crisis of wage stagnation. Um, and I say most common response because uh, there are more payday lenders out there than. McDonald's and Starbucks, and, and studies show McDonald's and Starbucks combined. And so they're, they're common, they're almost everywhere. Um, and payday loans, unlike a credit card, a payday loans is expressly designed to address the issue of, 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 of lack of money from income. Um, and, and so that's why it's called a payday loan. It's the, the, the loan, for that loan, you have to have two things, which we consider sort of um, um, really pillars for middle class. You must have a paycheck, a working a job, and secondly, you must have a bank account. You write a check, 
um, drawn from your bank and say that uh, this check is going to be good in two weeks from now when I get my paycheck. And so these are the, these are the markers of of middle class status. And and, and so, but we see that these thing, uh, petty lending again has has spread more wide and again more commonplace uh, than both Starbucks and McDonald's. Um, and these things we consider markers of of, of middle class life. And and I'll say this too. Um, that the Federal Reserve um, earlier this year came out with a report that four out of 10 Americans cannot cover a $400 emergency expense. Uh, and so while we think of payday loans as something that other people might take out, um, realize that nearly half of Americans now are, are, are really living from paycheck to paycheck um, and, and lack $400 to cover an emergency expense. So many of us are just one um, job loss and income shock away for, for a payday loan. And, and, and so it's something that, that really does open this, itself up um, to, to more consumers than those who are actually taking out the loan itself. Uh, Devin Fergus, the book is Land of the Fee, and uh, it is about the hidden costs and the decline of the American middle class. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam, and go Dodgers. <laughs> <We'll see. laughs> All right, we'll see. Right. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it. But I appreciate the uh, appreciate the time. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye -bye. Take care.